So the first phrase of happy birthday is dominant, dominant, submedian, dominant, tonic, leading tone. If we say it in names rather than numbers. So B is the leading tone if we're in C major, which of course we are. But if we were in fact in G major, which is still technically a possibility and a count that our subconscious will be making, what is this B in G major? B would be the median. Very good, the median. A minor or major third from G. Which one is it? A minor or major third. You don't have to count the half steps to know this. It's major. It's major, a major third. If B is the median in G major, it's of course a major third from G. Four half steps. So even though we know because of how the song continues that we are definitely playing five, five, six, five, eight, seven here, we might also say that when we play this B, if it's still a physical possibility that we are in G major, we are hearing a little bit of median as well as a little bit of leading tone in a similar way that we might say an A is also a little bit E. E colours A because it's the first different note in A's overtones, the perfect fifth. We actually hear a little E when we play A within A. In the same way, the closest key to C major, G major, is also floating around in the overtones of C major and in our subconscious counts which aim to identify the tonic. This colours to some degree what we experience. So when we play, we are hearing the dominant chord and the leading tone with aromas or overtones of tonic chord and median. The second phrase of happy birthday is similar to the first, only that on the end now we have DC instead of CB. Does that C at the end of this phrase feel resolved? No. Not so much, no. And now the C is coming at the end of the phrase, unlike the last phrase where it was the penultimate note. So we really should be experiencing tonic vibes here, resolution, relaxation, but we don't. It seems like we now have built up substantial or meaningful ambiguity such that the C no longer feels like the tonic. G major isn't just a possibility now, it's almost a concern. We are unsure of what key we are in. Why might that be? We have one noon note here that we haven't heard yet, so it would make sense for us to first look there. So what is the noon note that appears in the second phrase if we play G, G, A, G, C, B, and then G, G, A, G, D, C? D. D, the noon note is D, of course. Why might this D help create real ambiguity about the key we are in? What is D in terms of G? It would be the dominant of G. It is the perfect fifth of G. So that's a very structural degree of G major, the dominant. And not just that, but the D is coming in an important place temporarily as well in regards to time. It's on the first beat of the measure and is thus accented, helping it feel even more structural, helping create more doubt about what's going on. Did we just fall from the supertonic to the tonic in C major? or from the dominant to the subdominant in G major. Another thing that helps generate this ambiguity is the structure of the two phrases in relation to one another. In the first phrase, in which we have no real reason to suspect we aren't in C major, we fall one scale degree from the tonic to the leading tone at the end of the phrase. What is the most similar degree to the tonic, the similar end opposite? The dominant. The dominant, which makes the interpretation that we just felt a scale degree from the dominant when we play DC, that we are in G major, more fitting with what is happening in the first phrase than the interpretation that we are still in C major and just dropped from the supertonic to the tonic when we move from D to C. So we have different interpretations pulling us in different directions. And so even though we are hearing the tonic here at the end of a phrase much like the last, we still feel tension. The interesting tension of ambiguity. Did we change keys? 
were we in G all along? What's going on? This isn't the mechanical or gravitational tension of one scale degree wanting to resolve to another. Rather, this is the tension arising from insecurity about what is actually happening mechanically or gravitationally. Where do these knots come from? What is their role? Who is their tonic? This is what we're experiencing on the second phrase, and enough so that the C, the tonic that we end with, doesn't feel resolved. The next phrase, after this, plays three Gs in a row. Those are three Gs, the third an octave higher than the first two, and the combined length of both, a quarter note. The higher G feels more tense, or more like a dominant than the lower ones, because there is an inherent tension in rising, a physical tension which we feel in music. The strings, for example, that make higher notes are very literally tenser, tighter than the strings that generate lower pitches. And apart from tighter, the higher strings are also thinner, making them quite literally sharper to the touch. We experience that very real physical tension musically when we jump an octave like this. This means that with this jump, we have an expectation to fall, and happy birthday doesn't keep us waiting. The first note we hear in our descent is an E, which is a new note we are yet to hear in Happy Birthday. What is E in C major? A uh, third, a, a major third. What scale degree is it? It's the median. The median. It's the first time we hear the median, the major third from C. This keeps us hanging on, so to speak, with a continued faith that the music is making the sense we had been attributing to it, that we are, in fact, in C major. Of course, there is also a melodic structure to look at here, apart from the degrees as positions in the scale. What interval do we have from G to E as it occurs in the melody? What interval do we have there from G to E? Start with the number. I feel like I should be going down, though. Yeah, you should. All oh, right. So is it a third? Yeah, a third, a descending third, no, because you have to count down there. And what kind of third? Is it major or minor? Major. Does it sound major? OK, minor. Minor. There's a number of ways of looking at this, no. If you have uh, uh, letters, straight natural notes, no, like we do here, G and E, if you notice a small space between them, like we have from E to F, uh -huh. then you know straight away it's minor. Right. No, of course, if you have natural straight letters, if you have sharps and flats, then you have to think a little bit more. No, but if you have letters, uh, with natural letters, and they cross the space from B to C or E to F, then it's minor. So you can look to that, and you can also count the half steps, but of course that's quicker than counting the yeah. half steps. It has three half steps, E to F, F to F sharp, F sharp to G. So that's a minor third, or a descending minor third. That's three half steps going down from G, as we just have a half step between F and E. How would you describe the feeling of this E? It needs to continue. It needs to go on. Yes, but... Do you identify any sensation in itself that it adds, apart from tension? No? That we're coming down a little bit from our celebration, maybe slightly announcing the ending, like a calming down. That's the descending minor third, which appears to help us understand that we will soon be wrapping up our celebration together with the median itself, which cues that we may be soon to clear up our tonal ambiguity, as we've just heard the median of C major for the first time. Just after that E, we have the C below it, the tonic, repeating the same characteristic rhythmic pattern that we began with now, with those two different length notes. Only now we are playing this pattern with the tonic, rather than with the dominant, as we had been previously. That's the first time we play that rhythmic pattern with the tonic. It's as if the C is saying, uh, yeah, 
The jig is up. It was me all along. I am the tonic. This is my song. What is the interval here? Down from E to C. The interval, another third. Another third. Is it major or minor? Major. Major. How did you work that out so quickly? Because I didn't have, I didn't cross a gap. You didn't cross a small gap yeah. from B to C to E to F. Well done. Brilliant. So we have a major third now. So our descent, the beginning of the end of our celebration, is ultimately an optimistic one. We resolve tonally on the C and on a descending major third. But we're not done playing yet. We continue to descend, even though there's no reason why we should be, considering that after every other example of until now, we have risen to higher notes. No, after that, previously, we've risen to higher notes. But now for the first time, after playing this pattern, we're going to continue descending. So the drop is unexpected. But at the same time, it fits perfectly because it's a continuation of the descent we began some notes ago. This is the kind of balance between satisfying and violating expectations in music that the human mind finds interesting or enjoyable to experience. The continued descent satisfies and violates expectations at once, like the punchline of a joke does. The notes we drop to from C are B and then A, the leading tone and submedian. This half of the descent mimics the first half in a way, which we can hear. From G to E and then E to C, we got a minor third and then a major third. What do we get from C to B on the second half of this descent? What is the interval? Start with the number. One. No, because we count both letters. Two. So it's a second. second. Now, you should be able to tell me straight away what kind of second it is, noticing the small space between B and C. It's um, a minor second. A minor second. No, we know this is a minor second because there is a half step only between C and B. So this must be a minor second. And a major second is two half steps, like what we have from B to A. So in this descent, we have two parts divided and united by in the middle. No, both parts descend by a minor and then a major interval. We experience this pattern through the respective qualities of the intervals and it offers further structure to this continued descent which in other ways remains an unexpected event. On the leading tone here, we play the subdominant chord. What is the subdominant chord of C major? So the chord based on the tonic note in C major, the C major chord is called the tonic chord. The G major chord in C major is called the dominant chord. It's based on the dominant note of C major. So what might the subdominant chord of C major be? If G major is the dominant chord, the subdominant chord is? Subdominant is F, F major. F major, the subdominant chord in C major is F major, no, built on F. What notes does the F major chord have? So you need to start on F as a tonic and find the median and the dominant. Or you can just skip a note. No, that's what we're doing always to build the chord. Degrees one, three, and five. So if F is one, three is? Three is A. And five is? C. C. So F major, the F major chord, has F, A, and C. No. So that's one, three, and five if F is one. F, A, C. Or skipping a letter. No. F. G no, A yes, B no, C yes, F, A, C. And none of these are sharps or flats. In the key of F major, we have one flat and that's B flat. And so the F major chord doesn't bring in any strange note to our key. It does bring in an important note though, the new note that it introduces. What note is that? 
have we heard A? The A is the submedian, so? F. F, F is the new note. And what does F do here? Why is F important? What is our ambiguity? Our tonal ambiguity in happy birthday? So our, our ambiguity is that we're, we're in C major, and then it, it looks like we're going into G, but we're not. We go back to C. So what does F tell us? Do we have F in G major? No. No, we have F sharp. That's the only different note between C major and G major. So F major, of course, gives us the F. That's the first time we hear the F, which holds up the idea that we are in, of course, C major, because in G major, we would have an F sharp. So it seems like a lot of clarification is happening here. We have the tonic adopting the rhythmic pattern previously owned by the dominant, that one. And then with the next note, B, we also hear the subdominant chord, which is based on F. Confirming further that we are in C major. This F is of course coming in the chords though, in the background, rather than in center stage in the melody. We don't have to wait long for that though. Now the F takes the characteristic rhythmic pattern in a similar way to how the tonic just did. Both of these notes are of utmost importance to the music's identity here. C is of course always important to the identity of C major, and in this context, where we have been flirting with the gray area between C and G major, F is also of essential importance to the music's identity. It is the note that confirms what we are not. This is not G major. F in G major is of course F sharp. So I'd say that at this stage, the F goes beyond the dissolution of ambiguity, which has arguably already been achieved by now. This high F is maybe more akin to a celebration of identity, of knowing who one is and who one is not. I am C major, and whilst I might look like G major, I'm my own flavor. Look at my F natural. <laughs> Interestingly, this confirming and fronting of identity happens during the part of the song where we introduce the name of the person that we're singing about. So whilst the tonal ambiguity is definitely resolved at this point, the tonal and rhythmic mechanics of the song are of course not resolved just yet. We still have tonal tension to resolve and expectations for the correct number of beats to play out. The remaining notes that achieve this are E, C, D, C which are three quarter notes and a half note. So going from the, the high F, what is E, C, D, C in numbers? Four, four, three, one, two, one. Three, so three, one, two, one, or including the Fs, four, four, three, one, two, one. So at a glance, it's easy to appreciate the general curvature of how this resolves looking at the numbers, no? which is something that degree names don't achieve quite like this. 4, 4, 3, 1, 2, 1. So we resolve firstly with a descent from 4 to 1. 4, 4, 3, 1. We might have some expectations about how this descent happens based on the last descent or descents previously we divided our long descent into two descents of a minor interval and then a major interval. So let's see how our final descent interacts with those expectations. What do we have from four to three, from F to E, what interval? A major second. From F to E? To F to E, there's no, there's no, right, so a minor second. Of course, we have a half step from F to E, so we have a minor second. So a minor interval. And from three to one, from E to C, what do we have? From E to C, a major third. A major interval, a major third. So this descent maintains those similarities to the previous descents, even though it's made of a different combination of intervals now. We ease into our final resolution whilst both satisfying and violating expectations in good measure. Just before ending our piece, we break our descent by going up to a D. Just before resolving finally to the tonic.
Now the D here that reverses our descent for a moment contains a layer of what we might call mock tension. We might even call it a musical joke. So we've been building up to a resolution, no, which we've been carefully putting together. And just as we begin this final resolution, so that's a D, no? What, what, what is the D in regards to G? All right, that's the fifth of G. So it's almost like that D, the supertonic, being the fifth of the fifth, the fifth of G major, is threatening to start complicating things again, to revive the doubt about the key we are in, or the threat to move keys, right at the end of the melody, and when everything else is leading us to expect resolution, as we descend in notes, we break that descent moving up to the D, almost threatening to continue this dance around and between C and G major, but then directly after that, we have resolution in it. It's almost like, nah, just kidding. I wasn't going to do that. A musical joke of sorts. <laughs> Part of what makes us really expect resolution here is that we can divide this melodic journey into four subsections. And this fourth section is of course the last of those. The first two sections repeat two very similar phrases, or the same phrase with a slight variation. The third section has the jump and the descent. And is the most different section. And the fourth section plays a phrase very similar to the first two phrases. Four is by far the most common number we'll find when we look at macrostructure, the bigger picture of musical pieces. Just as it is most common to divide a measure into four beats, it is most common to divide a melody or section of music into four smaller parts. The simple melody of Happy Birthday spans eight bars, eight measures, four subsections of two bars each. And so resolution here at the end of the fourth section is very expected. The D breaking the descent and threatening all kinds of things before falling back to the final tonic resolution on the C is a little like a footballer pretending to kick the ball one way before kicking it exactly where he was expecting him to.